Welcome to the Emerging Risks for County Governments breakout session. My name is Jeremy Bennett, VACO Director of Intergovernmental Affairs. This is one of several pre-conference breakout sessions that your annual VACO conference registration entitles you to review at your leisure. VACO staff selected speakers to provide information and discussion on numerous pressing issues to county governments, including emerging risks. This includes concerns pertaining to changes in workers' compensation and liability protections, qualified immunity, and cyber extortion and social engineering. This session is made possible by our partnership with VACORP, whose generosity and service as a fully comprehensive risk management program provides strength and stability to county governments across the Commonwealth. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this session's keynote speaker, Chris Carey, Administrator of VACORP. Chris is responsible for administrative oversight of the VACORP property and liability and workers' compensation self-insurance pool. Prior to becoming Administrator of VACORP in 2008, he served as assistant administrator, a position he had held since 1996 when he joined VACORP. Chris earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Insurance and Risk Management from the University of South Carolina in 1992. Chris, welcome and thank you for joining us to talk about these important issues. I'll turn things over to you. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm happy to be uh, doing this presentation today. Um, you know, I've been working with Virginia County government since 1994. Uh, and uh, I would have told you uh, only a few months ago that I had thought I had just about seen everything, but um, uh, over the past few months, there have been a number of uh, new things that have uh, come upon us, and um, and those are things that uh, we're uh, paying attention to and trying to get information out and provide training to, uh, to our members uh, to make sure that they uh, know what to look for. Um, COVID-19 uh, has uh, certainly changed uh, the way that, uh, that we handle some of these items, uh, but, um, but risk management in general uh, uh, really requires us to be uh, flexible and adaptable, and, and we're going to try to give you a few things to look out for as we um, you know, go into uh, 2021, and uh, hopefully we start uh, coming out of these COVID-19 scenarios, but I believe uh, we will still be dealing with some challenges with or without COVID-19. Uh, so Jeremy, if you can go to the next slide. With pleasure. Uh, so first of all, to start out with is I'm going to go through a bunch of information today, uh, but we do uh, give you a little bit of a disclaimer that uh, uh, you should really check with your legal team uh, before you uh, uh, make any changes in policy or otherwise. Uh, so. Uh, you know, please make sure that you run this by your county attorney um, uh, before you make any changes. Uh, we're all, uh, obviously uh, here to help as well, so uh, if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to send them to us. Uh, so if you go to the next slide. Um, workers' compensation, uh, like Jeremy said earlier, we're going to talk about three main things. Um, the first one's workers' compensation. Uh, it has the most activity going on in it of any of the things that we're dealing with right now. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, law enforcement uh, and potential changes, uh, some of which have already occurred in the special session that's just recently or is in the process of concluding now uh, as it relates to law enforcement and immunity. Uh, and then the third thing, uh, which is uh, really developing quite rapidly, is um, uh, cyber liability, so uh, how uh, uh, your computer systems, uh, especially now that we're in COVID-19 and computers are being used more and more for more things, uh, some of that has changed. So we'll go through those three basic items, but workers' comp will probably spend the most time on. Uh, so in the 2020 session of the General Assembly, they made changes to the cancer presumptions. Uh, we will review those. We have some prospective changes to uh, the heart presumptions uh, to add EMTs and correction officers. Those changes have not been made yet, uh, but we'll go through some of the cost items related to that, uh, and I do believe we'll see that in the 2021 session. Uh, we are dealing with now some changes in PTSD that were enacted in the 2020 session. Uh, there was a movement that was passed by the House but rejected by the Senate in the uh, special session that dealt with COVID-19 presumptions under the Workers' Compensation Act, and there is a study that was uh, um, uh, requested by the 2020 General Assembly session uh, 
uh, on repetitive motion, cumulative trauma injuries. Uh, that report is uh, uh, in the process of being finalized and presented to the Workers' Comp Commission, uh, and we'll go through that as well. Uh, if we want to go to the next slide. Um, this slide just really gives you uh, really basically just the information. Oh, no, back one. Uh, this slide gives you the basically just gives you an illustration, I think, of what you would just expect to see. Uh, if we look at workers' compensation claims over the past 10 years, uh, I don't think anybody's surprised that public safety uh, takes up the lion's share. And I'm not saying that in a negative way towards public safety. Uh, I just think that's the nature uh, of the work. And, and for public safety, for our purposes, we're talking about law enforcement, uh, firefighters, and, and EMS. Uh, and then you will see that uh, teachers or instruction uh, are the second highest category. Um, but, um, but I did want you to see that when there are changes that cause claims to go up, even if it's only a couple of percent, that couple of percent is, is being applied to a number that's quite a bit larger than any of the other numbers that we deal with. So uh, if my um, uh, workers' compensation claims for, say, law enforcement go up 5%, uh, that's a big number. And uh, it's important to understand the scale uh, of what we're talking about as we get into uh, these discussions. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so as it relates to public safety, uh, you can see that we have broken out the average claim size, and this is for all claims. Um, and you can see that uh, police um, has the highest average claim size of almost 10,000 uh, with varying ranges uh, of claims that go down to um, about uh, $3,400 for animal control. Uh, but you can see that on average the claim sizes are, are fairly large. Uh, those are fair, I think those are fairly large claim sizes uh, for a group. Uh, if you can click one time, uh, so uh, our, the average workers' comp claim cost is $6,200. Uh, if you click again, you'll see that 7% of uh, claims result in lost time. Uh, now here's the difference is on the average presumption claim, uh, if you click again, you'll see that our average presumption claim is about $63,000. Um, so although our average claim is $10,000, uh, the average presumption claim is quite a bit larger. Uh, and when we get into presumptions here uh, uh, next, we will be a little bit more specific as far as what that means. So if you can click to the next slide. Uh, before I get into this, so a presumption under the Workers' Comp Act, really what it does is it changes uh, the burden of proof uh, from the employee to the employer. So under uh, almost every workers' compensation claim that we have, it is the employee's responsibility to prove that their uh, injury resulted from their job. Uh, but on presumption claims, that's reversed. Uh, so the employer, uh, when a claim is filed for these presumptions, uh, the employer has to prove that it was not job-related. Uh, so it makes it uh, a, a much different scenario to, to review these claims. Uh, and, and we're going to focus on the cancer uh, and heart uh, presumptions. Uh, but uh, when we get into the COVID-19 discussion, we'll bring in the infectious disease presumption. Uh, we're not really going to talk about the lung presumption here. That's pretty well established and only applies to firefighters, so we won't really get into that. Uh, but what we dealt with in the current fiscal year, so in fiscal year 21 that we're in right now, uh, the General Assembly added um, three cancers uh, to the list of cancers that are covered. They averaged, uh, uh, included uh, colon, brain, and testicular cancer uh, on top of the cancers that we already uh, were dealing with. Uh, these cancers are presumed uh, to be an occupational disease or, or on the job. Uh, but when we talk about these cancers, the difference between these cancers and the cancers we had before is brain cancer uh, is the most expensive cancer to treat. 
so when, when we start adding cancers, most of the cancers that we're adding now uh, are most likely going to um, raise the average claim size that we're dealing with. So if I told you before our average presumption claim is 62,000, uh, it's likely that the average claim size is going to start to escalate a little bit as we go through uh, the next 10 years and we start to get more of these claims under, uh, under our belt. Uh, the good part with brain cancer in particular is the frequency of this is quite a bit less than, uh, say, prostate cancer, which is one of the other covered cancers, uh, but nonetheless it is quite a bit more expensive. Uh, the other thing that they did is there was language where a, a um, firefighter needed to prove that they came in contact with a toxic substance uh, to get access to the cancer presumptions. That language has now been removed. So. Um, so the uh, uh, standard for being able to qualify for cancer uh, presumptions is uh, quite a bit lower than it was before. So we would expect that these cases to get, um, to get accepted more frequently uh, than they had in the past uh, because of this uh, particular uh, uh, issue. And then it reduced the length of service requirements. So you used to have to have 12 years of consecutive service uh, to be eligible for a presumption, and they dropped that to five years. Uh, most of you saw uh, in your workers' compensation premiums this year uh, a uh, slight uptick uh, uh, in your uh, law enforcement and fire rates uh, related to these types of issues. Um, uh, this one was the reason for the fire. Uh, we'll talk about PTSD in a minute, which is what got into the um, law enforcement. Uh, one of the other areas uh, that uh, causes us uh, concern maybe a little bit less on the EMT side than the corrections officer side is uh, right now uh, only firefighters and law enforcement get access to heart presumptions. Um, if uh, EMTs and then it, 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 in a higher concern correctional officers get added uh, to the heart presumption, we will see uh, those claims uh, go up and we would expect the correctional officers claims to go up quite a bit, uh, particularly as it relates to regional jails. Uh, I think Really, the vast majority of uh, county government uh, corrections is now handled by regional jails. Uh, I know there are still uh, um, several counties that uh, handle corrections on their own, but, but regional jails, are, I think, are really handling the lion's share of that today. Um, and then uh, the third thing that happened uh, is uh, PTSD, uh, and the uh, the General Assembly did adopt uh, some PTSD language. It was not added as a presumption, which was one of the concerns that we had, but uh, it was nonetheless added uh, as a uh, benefit that went into effect on July 1st. Uh, so uh, those were some things we had to deal with. Uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll get into a little bit more detail on PTSD. Um, there's a five-step process for qualifying for PTSD. Um, I'm not going to go through all five of the steps, but uh, it essentially creates a, um, an eligibility process uh, for PTSD. Um, and then uh, how they manage the benefits is a little bit different uh, than how we would traditionally manage benefits. So typically, if you qualify under the Workers' Comp Act, uh, you would uh, be eligible for a lifetime medical award for that injury, and then you would be eligible for up to 500 weeks. Uh, of uh, wage benefits or indemnity benefits uh, from that particular injury. Under the PTSD, they changed that um, a little bit, uh, but, uh, but they did keep the burden of proof uh, on the employee rather than the employer, which was a good thing. Uh, they did limit wage replacement benefits for a PTSD claim uh, to one year uh, instead of 10 years or the 500 weeks. Uh, and uh, they did limit the medical benefits, so rather than a lifetime medical award, uh, the medical benefits are uh, four years. Uh, and then the other thing which is really uh, kind of unusual and not something that we see a lot is uh, it does coordinate uh, the benefit with other, other sources. So if there's a PTSD case and you have uh, either a disability or Social Security or some other type of, uh, uh, of benefit award, uh, we are able to coordinate um, uh, with those uh, benefit awards, uh, with those other benefit programs uh, to make sure that um, the employee isn't <clears throat> getting more money than they were prior to the um, diagnosis, which on occasion can happen in the workers' comp system. So 
Um, those are things uh, that uh, limited it. Um, uh, I bring this up as an ongoing concern, though, is because what we've seen over the years is, is once this law gets into place, uh, the hardest part is getting the law into place. Uh, uh, we would expect to see this come up again year over year over year uh, to try to uh, expand and um, build on this benefit over time, which, which I would expect to have happen um, um, on a continuous basis. Uh, that this would be one of the um, uh, benefits that we would see attacked uh, year over year over year. Uh, I think that um, if you paid attention to the uh, special session at all, uh, or even what's going on on, on the national level, uh, mental health uh, is a, a hot button issue. And I think how we deal with and pay or manage uh, benefit programs for mental health are going to be something that stay in the forefront uh, for uh, quite a long period of time. Uh, so that's what's going on on the PTSD side. Uh, if we can go on. Uh, I'm showing you this again. I did present this uh, at uh, the last FACO conference last year, uh, but I did want to uh, reiterate this because uh, one of the things that always gets lost by the General Assembly, and trust me, it always gets lost with the General Assembly, is they never actually connect the dots between Workers' Compensation and Line of Duty Act as it relates to uh, uh, public safety. So every time uh, we get a program that can lead to a permanent uh, disability, uh, it potentially adds costs to your Line of Duty Act uh, uh, costs as well. As you know, back in 2011, uh, local governments came, became responsible for the costs of Line of Duty. Uh, uh, benefits which uh, r result from either death or permanent disability in the line of duty. And um, uh, line of duty claims are typically quite a bit larger than presumption claims. So if you see uh, that I, t if you see on the screen that uh, the average uh, presumption claim is about 63,000, uh, you can see that the average line of duty claim is about 275,000. So more than four times uh, higher uh, than the workers' comp claims is the line of duty claim. Uh, so every time we add a single claim into that line of duty system uh, by creating a workers' comp presumption, uh, we add material costs. So, so every presumption permanent disability uh, essentially averages out to a cost of almost $350,000 per claim. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, workers' compensation costs and line of duty costs as a whole, on what the premiums are, uh, just adding a few claims can move the needle uh, on what localities pay. So um, uh, one of the things that we projected was between 10 and 20 new heart claims per year. Uh, if EMTs get included, uh, we have projected between 15 and 30 uh, new heart presumption claims if corrections get included. Uh, uh, if the uh, cancer claims, which did in fact pass, uh, we would expect between 7 and 15 cancer claims per year. Uh, we're only three months into this now, so it's uh, too early for us to know what that's going to look like. Uh, it will be, will be interesting uh, to see uh, over the coming years if these projections actually turn out. And then on the PTSD side, that's uh, where you see the guy pulling his hair out. Uh, who knows what's going to happen on the PTSD side? This is, is where a big unknown uh, is going to happen, but uh, but essentially, based off of the averages that we have, uh, we see um, you know we see claims uh, having a pretty wide range of of what the ultimate impact could be. Um, so so we'll uh, we'll see how this develops over time. Uh, we took about a five percent increase in workers' comp costs specific to line of duty, or not line of duty, public safety, uh, and. Um, uh, that 5% uh, increase uh, averaged about 2% on the overall workers' comp cost for FY21. Uh, going into uh, uh, your budgets for this coming year, um, most of the discussion on that's going to relate to uh, whether the General Assembly tries to keep pushing forward with any benefits for uh, COVID-19, and if they do push forward with benefits for COVID-19, whether they continue to insist that those uh, benefits get paid on a retroactive basis. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, Jeremy, you can go to the next slide. Um, well, I guess we'll get into it in a little bit. It has arrived. Uh, I didn't realize that was the next slide when I said that, but um, 
works. <clears throat> um, I did want to spend some time on COVID-19. We actually did a lot of work uh, in preparation for the special session with our actuaries. Uh, my claim staff did a, a great job going through uh, our uh, COVID-19 claim submissions uh, to uh, do some cost projections, and then we had an actuary review all of those claims and try to calculate some numbers out, uh, and I'll go through that. But uh, House Bill 5028 was the bill that got passed. Uh, it got killed in the Senate, but it made it out of the House, uh, and it was a pretty heavy bill. Uh, I think I used the term heavy correct, um, uh, but it included COVID-19 uh, as a presumption. So. Uh, when I say presumption, let's remember what I talked about before. That means the burden of proof is on the employer that the employee contracted. Uh, it would be the employer's responsibility to prove that the employee did not contract COVID-19 at work. It would not be the employee's responsibility to prove that they uh, got it at work and didn't get it elsewhere. Uh, so that was a pretty heavy lift. Uh, but it did include uh, coverage for law enforcement uh, firefighters and EMTs, uh, which was the initial uh, component of the bill, uh, and then state corrections got added, which led to regional jails getting added, and then ultimately school board employees, not teachers, not just teachers, but school board employees, so bus drivers, uh, custodial workers, school maintenance workers, school nutrition workers, uh, and teachers, all of them would have qualified for uh, a COVID-19 presumption. Uh, uh, that, um, that was problematic, and I'll show you why in these coming slides. If we go to the next slide, Jeremy. Uh, part of the problem that we get into when we talk about a COVID-19 presumption in particular was the, the way the language was worded, uh, it would have covered both a positive diagnosis and just a simple exposure. Uh, it would have been retroactive to January 1st, 2020. Um, so we would have to go back months and months and months and try to figure out who was doing what and when. Uh, but, but just to give you perspective on this, the way the language is currently written in that House Bill 5028, you didn't actually have to get the disease to get the benefit. Uh, you just had to be exposed to the disease, and you just had to prove that you were exposed to the disease. Now, that might not seem like much, but uh, when you look at a 14-day quarantine period uh, plus uh, what a hospital is charging for uh, COVID-19 testing, we were looking at uh, about a $2,500 per claim uh, on average um, uh, cost. And that's just for exposure cases. If there was any medical treatment required, then it would just go up from there. Uh, but if, it, if a test came back negative, uh, there was still workers' compensation benefits. Uh, it would have been the first disease in Virginia's history where you could have received workers' compensation benefits without actually getting the disease. Uh, that's not really a good standard to set uh, from uh, a workers' compensation perspective uh, at least the way I see it. Uh, you know, we provide a lot of coverage for infectious disease for EMTs, uh, but uh, the infectious disease presumptions as they are now require a change in condition, uh, meaning the change in condition is, is you actually got the disease. Uh, if you don't get the disease, uh, you don't get the benefit. Um, so uh, um, even under the infectious disease presumption, there has to be a change in condition. Under COVID-19, the way it's being looked at right now, uh, that would not have been required. There would have been no required change in condition. Uh, and we think that uh, really is, um, is problematic. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is where we got into it with our actuary and had our actuary do some uh, cost, uh, uh, cost projections for us. Um, so we use Select Actuarial out of Nashville. We've been using Select Actuarial for VACORP since 1994. Uh, so we have a pretty good track record with this independent actuary on uh, projecting out claims for uh, us on various items. Um, and we had them do a um, projection 
uh, of uh, the presumption for COVID-19 claims. Uh, here's where it got tough. Uh, we had uh, public safety data uh, from March through August when we had this actuarial uh, report put together. So we had, I think at the time, uh, probably close to 400 cases that have been filed. I think right now we're sitting, oh, I don't know, probably around 600 or so cases that have been filed. Uh, and then we had uh, some data that had already been released from some other states um, that was specific to public safety. At the time that we conducted this study, we did not have uh, any school data because uh, we didn't know schools were intended to be in the bill. Uh, none of the draft bills that we saw going into the session included school board employees, so we didn't really know that was coming. Uh, uh, we didn't really catch us by surprise, but we didn't know that that was going to, to hit that bill. Uh, and it didn't really matter anyways, because at the time all of this was going on, schools had been closed from March through August anyways, so there wasn't really any data to look at. Uh, so the impact of the school piece was was pretty difficult uh, to go through uh, at that point. But um, uh, we broke the data into um, into four uh, uh, categories. So we had uh, retroactive, so claims on the retroactive period, which would have been back to January, uh, the actuary projected uh, retroactive claims without a positive test would have cost about $450,000. Uh, retroactive claims with a positive test uh, uh, would have cost about $1.7 million. Uh, and then we looked at prospective claims, which was, would have been from uh, September through uh, June 30th of 2021, so in the current fiscal year of just over a million. Uh, and then prospective claims with a positive test at about $3.6 million, uh, which would have brought us to total expected claims. Uh, of about 6.7 million if everything was uh, put in as anticipated. And these are VACORP costs. These are not uh, statewide costs. Uh, we did come up with some cost estimates uh, that uh, self-insured localities could use to uh, do some of their own estimates. So, so this is what VACORP would have anticipated uh, to pay over the course of, the, um, of about an 18-month period to cover uh, these COVID cases as presented in that bill. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Jeremy. Uh, and then the other thing we had the actuary do is come up with um, um, loss rates. So what, what would a projection be for a fiscal year for a public entity um, to uh, calculate out what their projected cost would be, uh, whether that be a um, um, a county government or a school board or a city or a town or or even a regional jail or any other type of authority. So uh, regardless of what type of employee uh, you could throw into the COVID-19 category, uh, we came up with a uh, projected cost of $0.85 cents per $100 of payroll uh, to pay for workers' compensation claims uh, if, if there's only coverage for positive tests. And if there's uh, coverage for positive tests and non-positive tests or exposure cases, uh, you would add another uh, 23 cents into that. So it'd be about a dollar eight per hundred dollars of payroll uh, to provide COVID-19 coverage, regardless of the payroll category, uh, uh, for a fiscal year. So that's for one fiscal year. That's not total. Uh, and, and I would assume as uh, these costs would go down, as we start to see. Uh, vaccines being developed or antiviral medications or antiviral treatments being made available over the coming years. Uh, I would expect those costs to start to go down a little bit, uh, but uh, for fiscal year 22, if that gets passed, uh, that's about what we think it would be in fiscal year 22. Uh, like I said earlier, we used our data from our public safety pool, and then we used data for uh, uh, development that came from uh, other states that have enacted uh, differing types of COVID-19 uh, legislation. Uh, but for us, we think on a statewide basis, and here's the statewide number, I told you that the projection for VACORP was about $6.7 million. Uh, we've estimated uh, on the low end, if only public safety employees are included, to the high end, 
uh, where uh, uh, public safety employees, corrections, and school board employees get included, that range would be between 25 uh, and 100 million dollars. Um, we think that is think that's about where it lies. That's a pretty wide estimate, uh, but if you look like um, we cover, you know, VACORP covers uh, almost six billion dollars worth of um, school payroll, for example. Uh, so uh, if they pass a, a, a presumption for school board employees, that six billion dollars in payroll would lead to a lot of anticipated costs uh, for workers' compensation claims uh, just for VACORP. Uh, so, so we think those are probably uh, reasonable and realistic estimates. Uh, based off of uh, uh, some of the um, uh, complex cases that require uh, long-term hospitalization, uh, use, of use of ventilators, uh, and the amount of time. So you can, e you can have somebody go into the hospital for one injury uh, that might be a small injury and then end up uh, having to stay in the hospital if they develop COVID-19 and then requiring two negative tests before they're released from the hospital, uh, you could have a, a normal workers' compensation claim that might have been twenty or twenty-five thousand dollars that turns into a three or four hundred thousand dollar claim in the snap of a finger uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 testing protocols. So uh, it's very easy for what we would normally think to be a simple type of injury or a simple type of illness to turn into a complex claim fairly quickly. Uh, which is why you get some of these uh, wide-ranging estimates on what the costs would be. Uh, but um, I don't think we have a, a choice uh, but to, uh, to be conservative in these estimates because um, this is not something uh, that we want to have to pay for years from now. Uh, and then the other thing uh, that uh, nobody's really talking about uh, on COVID-19 is uh, what are the long-term implications? So if you give somebody a lifetime medical award for COVID-19, um, you know, we don't know if it's going to be like asbestos or, you know, mesothelioma uh, where we're paying these claims 30 or 40 years from now. A lot of people think that uh, you can get this and then get over it like the flu uh, and then be back to normal. Uh, but um, we don't really know what the long-term potential damage could be to respiratory, symptom, uh, respiratory systems. Uh, uh, there's a lot of things that we don't really know yet. So uh, when we decide that we're going to give somebody or a class of employees uh, access to um, lifetime medical care for an injury or an illness, and we don't have any idea what the uh, prospective outcomes from that injury or illness are going to be, um, it requires you to be a bit more conservative in your cost estimates than you normally would be. Uh, it's pretty simple for me to tell you right now how many uh, knee replacements I'm going to have to pay for in a year uh, and how long those injuries are going to last and, and how many weeks of disability or physical therapy I'm going to have to pay for that and then what the average settlement cost is for those claims. All of that is unknown on COVID-19. So, um, so you're asking educated people to give a best guess um, and I laugh, um, you know, the uh, National Council on Compensation Insurance is the uh, largest statistical agency in the world on workers' compensation exposures, and they came out with a national estimate of $1 billion to $80 billion. Uh, and uh, in my world, that means I don't know. Uh, so that they should have said, we don't have any idea what this is going to be, rather than giving a $1 billion to $80 billion estimate, because... You know, you're talking about multiple standard deviations. There's nothing uh, that anybody can do with that information other than say, we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, but it is what the risk is and the exposure is, uh, so the uh, potential costs of that. Uh, and the other problem with this, and I haven't put this on a slide, but um, the uh, federal government has made it fairly difficult on states to use any of their CARES Act money uh, to pay or provide the localities as assistance for providing workers' compensation benefits. Uh, one of our strategies with the General Assembly was to try to get them to allocate some CARES Act money to pay for these benefits if they were going to award them. Um, um, the, um, I think the ruling from that was that the monies would have to be expended before December 31st. 
so there was going to be some problems with making that happen. So uh, uh, on an overall basis, just the COVID-19 as it relates to workers' compensation continues to be kind of a uh, high cost, uh, unknown type of exposure. Uh, but I think, and I'll ask Jerry, Jeremy to disagree with me if I'm wrong, uh, but if, I think the general, uh, the uh, special session, particularly the House, made it clear that this was going to come back up in the 2021 session. So uh, although yeah. they didn't adopt anything in the, the special session, it seems likely that this will come back up as a potential item in 2021. Yeah, Chris, and, and I, I've just been fascinated by um, the information you've been provided. And, you know, you, you and I have been working on this issue for a few months now, but um, this has been a great presentation so far. But I'll just uh, respond that, yeah, the one of the patrons uh, has indicated publicly that he intends to revisit this issue, as have uh, members of Senate Finance, where both, um, both these pieces of legislation dealing with the COVID presumption uh, met their demise. They've members of that committee have indicated an interest in revisiting this in January, um, which leads me to say two things. Uh, first, to thank you and Vacor for all your efforts on this and uh, the real impact that the actual data had for our advocacy efforts and uh, our conversations with legislators and, and committee staff. Um, you know what this would do to local governments if it were to pass. And and secondly, uh, just to say that. When you're talking about the unknowns in terms of long term damage to um, COVID infected individuals and then the severity and number of cases, uh, those were unknowns in August. And they correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but those unknowns still remain. Even if this, you know, we were to revisit this in January, um, those unknowns haven't changed. No, there's, there's, um, there uh, are still substantial unknowns. Uh, we still have not seen uh, how vaccinations are going to work. Uh, we don't know uh, how vaccines are going to work on people that have already been infected. Uh, uh, we don't know if we would have to pay for those vaccines under a, an awarded workers' compensation claim. Uh, we don't know uh, how antiviral treatments are going to work. Uh, uh, and again, uh, we don't know uh, after really just uh, seven or eight months. We still don't really know what the long-term potential impacts are for uh, permanent damage or um, a damage that could revisit itself year over year over year uh, as it relates to uh, COVID-19. So there are, are still substantial unknowns from a medical perspective that um, uh, make it hard to project what those costs are going to be. Uh, um, going forward. Um, another argument that existed on the legislation was whether retroactivity is constitutional. Uh, there are varying legal opinions as to whether or not um, um, making changes to substantive law on a retroactive basis are permissible. Uh, so even if they do pass a COVID-19 presumption, uh, if it contains retroactive language, it's likely that this will get drug out in court for many years uh, to come uh, as it relates to uh, any retroactive provisions. Uh, as of today, we continue to handle workers' compensation based off of the laws that are on the books today. So we are, we are treating uh, COVID-19 as an ordinary disease of life, uh, and um, we are uh, investigating each case with, with uh, employees. Uh, trying to uh, determine uh, if they do have a positive test where that might have come from. And, uh, and that's how, that's really all we can do at this point. Uh, and if as we continue on uh, um, ordinary diseases of life, uh, if you move to the next slide, and, and I think we're gonna cover the last thing that we're gonna cover on uh, workers' compensation uh, relates to um, cumulative trauma. Uh, so historically in Virginia, we have not paid for uh, repetitive motion uh, or cumulative trauma type injuries. So uh, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, has actually been handled under those same ordinary disease of life uh, provisions. Um, uh, when JLARC uh, uh, when JLARC did a study uh, a year and a half ago, 
one of the items that they came up with uh, on the workers' comp system was that we were the only state in the country that did not have any coverage for cumulative trauma or repetitive motion. Uh, so JLARC recommended a study uh, uh, on cumulative trauma injuries, which uh, the Virginia Workers' Comp Commission went out for bid, uh, selected a vendor, and that vendor is, is poised to deliver their report uh, uh, regarding cumulative trauma. Uh, just to give you an idea what that means is typically, like if uh, somebody comes to us and says, hey, I hurt my back, uh, I lifted 20 boxes today, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't pay that injury in Virginia unless the person can tell you which one of the 20 boxes they injured their back on. If they wake up three days later just sore from lifting 20 boxes, that's typically not something that gets covered in Virginia. So we don't really know uh, where this is going to go or how it's going to develop, uh, but, uh, but it, that report is getting ready to be delivered, and we would expect there to be action on whatever those recommendations are in the upcoming 2021 session. Uh, uh, I have no projections on what those costs could be at this stage because I haven't seen the report of the recommendations. Um, it could be very nominal uh, uh, or it could be quite substantial depending on the degree that neck, uh, backs and necks get into it. Uh, carpal tunnel wouldn't really move the needle, but backs and necks could move the needle. Uh, so it really just depends on how they do it. But, but this is something that should be on your radar screen uh, coming into this next uh, session uh, of the General Assembly in 2021. This, this will be something that comes up. Uh, so I'm done on workers' compensation. Um, Jeremy, do you want to, are there any questions that you have to follow up on that before we go into law enforcement? Um, I think you've done, I mean, as always, Chris, you're doing a, a wonderful job and I think you've covered uh, the majority of my questions. I think when we're talking about the fiscal impact and the fact that this is likely to come up in January, um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it'd be important for uh, our members to stress in conversations with their elected officials, their representatives in the GA, um, that these may be well-meaning bits of legislation, but they have a real impact and a potentially a budget busting impact if they were enacted and that the right. state should keep that in mind uh, if they do want to move forward with this that local governance may not be able to shoulder this burden alone yeah that's correct and and we are uh, prepared at this stage um, as soon as december 31st hits i am going to uh, send uh, data back to our actuary and have uh, 12 months worth of data analyzed by the actuary and have a new uh, cost estimate, which could be lower, it could be higher, I don't really know, but we will come out with uh, uh, new cost estimates. And, and obviously, as time goes on, these cost estimates will become more accurate. Uh, so this cost estimate will probably be more accurate than the one we did in August. And we'll just keep going down that road and, and hoping that um, if uh, if they do want to do this, that they understand that there needs to be a little bit of relief uh, on the financial side as it relates to uh, providing some of these uh, benefit programs. Uh, Jeremy, you want to switch to the next one? Uh, the workers' compensation. The uh, workers' compensation took up most of the time. Uh, the law enforcement. Uh, I will go through, and it, it will not take as much time as the workers' comp, but I, but I think nonetheless it is still a very important issue that's out there. Uh, so what I wanted to do was really go through law enforcement structure in Virginia. Uh, I wanted to go through, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I do want you to see the scope of the, uh, uh, the um, uh, changes in law that were enacted during the special session, uh, and then uh, go through some of the sovereign immunity uh, issues that are going to come up, and then the, and with that sovereign immunity, uh, uh, what could be some of the cost issues that come up. Um, so law enforcement, and I, I have an illustration on the next slide, but but really we're talking about first response with law enforcement, um, and then court Sorry, security. Sir. Yeah, you can go to the next slide, Jeremy, from here. Uh, you have court security, corrections, and then regional jails. And if we go to the next slide, um, really just puts it on a chart. So we have first response, and for county governments, we have 10 counties that have police departments, and we have 85 counties that have a sheriff. Uh, counties that um, have a police department are insured by the locality. Most of those localities are self-insured. So. Um, you know, outside of uh, Prince George County and um, 
and, and uh, Albemarle County, uh, all of the other localities with police departments have, have fairly large self-insured retentions, uh, usually around $250,000 or higher. Uh, and then if uh, you're one of the 85 counties with the sheriff uh, uh, handling first response, uh, uh, those 85 uh, sheriffs are covered by VA risk. Uh, that's actually mandated in state code by, by code section 2.2-1839. So all of the sheriff's constitutional officers in general uh, are mandated to be covered by uh, VA risk, a state agency, and I'll go through the cost issues with that in, in, in just a minute. Uh, court security is all provided by the sheriffs, and they're all insured by VA risk. Uh, corrections is all handled by the sheriff, and it's insured by VA risk. And then you have regional jails that can replace corrections. Uh, you have a regional jail board. Uh, sheriffs are, are on those regional jail boards along with some other local officials and regional jails are predominantly insured by VA risk, but they have the option to opt out of VA risk if they want and be insured elsewhere. Constitutional officers have no such right to opt out of VA risk. Uh, regional jails can. Uh, so as of today, most of the regional jails are in VA risk. There's a handful, three or four, that have opted out. Um, and the three or four that have opted out, VACORP handles their liability. Uh, but that gives you just a, a brief uh, overview of, of what we're talking about here. So most of the law enforcement exposures that face county governments are actually, the financials of that are handled uh, at the state level, uh, but the counties get charged back for that, and I'll go through that a little bit because I was actually a little bit surprised by those numbers. Uh, if we go to the next slide, and there's three slides of this, and I just wanted you to get an idea of what was passed during the special session. So, you know, you can't pull anybody over for violation of a motorcycle noise ordinance anymore. You can't pull anybody over if you smell marijuana. Uh, you have to see it. If you smell it, you can't do anything. Uh, you really can't enforce or pull anybody over. Uh, they changed all the enforcement laws of minors. Uh, they changed the enforcement laws for learner's permits. Uh, if your vehicle isn't registered, uh, they can't pull you over until the registration is more than four months past due. Uh, they can't pull you over if you're smoking in a car with a minor anymore. Uh, you can't stop a pedestrian for anything anymore. Go to the next slide. Uh, they changed all of the vehicle equipment enforcement, so they can't pull you anymore. If your taillight is out or if your brake lights don't work, if your windows are tinted, they can't do anything of that. Uh, they added prohibitions of chokeholds or neck restraints. Uh, they put in a provision that allows the Attorney General to investigate any agency where they believe there's a pattern of misconduct, so they made it much easier for the Attorney General to come in and, and do investigations of the agencies. Uh, they made uh, FOIA requests easier uh, on uh, uh, law enforcement related matters. Uh, they prohibited no-knock warrants. Uh, they changed the hiring standards, uh, so they made it uh, uh, um, uh, a little more difficult to hire. Um, they uh, give localities uh, immunity for disclosing information on, on officers that have been terminated. Uh, so you can, um, you can terminate officers and then share that information for the reasoning with other entities easier than you could before. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, they changed all of the training requirements. Uh, they uh, have put a prohibition on uh, the acquisition of military surplus equipment. Uh, we have recently gone through, we have uh, uh, about a dozen members that have a, uh, uh, what is referred to as an MRAP. Uh, we're, we are getting ready to discuss some of the new requirements with those localities. Uh, you now have to get a waiver if you want to use any, anything that you have acquired in the past. Um, they are now creating some databases. Uh, they are uh, creating a database of any officer that is involved in a prohibited practice. Uh, they are changing the, the uh, use of force uh, uh, protocols and training for use of force as it relates to batons, uh, bean bags, things like that. Uh, they are giving localities uh, um, a uh, option or really almost incentivizing localities to create civilian oversight bodies. Uh, they are requiring police officers to intervene on other police officers if they see that they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, so that just gives you an overview of all of the things that were changed. That's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, that's a lot of stuff that localities are going to have to get done here over the next coming months. Now, 
Why did I share all of that with you? Um, I share all of that with you because when you require that many changes in an organization, um, it's going to be difficult to enact all of those changes and get people trained on them between now and next July 1st. Uh, so it seems, if you go to the next uh, slide, Jeremy, it does seem reasonable at this stage that, that, they are, that, that the stage is now set for considerably more lit litigation against states and localities and constitutional officers. Uh, now, um, they didn't take away sovereign immunity or qualified immunity yet, uh, but I believe if I interpreted what came out of the special session correctly, uh, that it is highly likely in this upcoming 2021 session that they changed all of these laws. They're giving everybody nine months to make all of these changes internally so that on July 1st next year, they can take away some of the immunities that you have. That seems likely to be occurring in the 2021 session in some form or fashion. I don't know exactly if we'll see the same laws that got killed in the special session come back and get passed or whether we'll see something new, but it does seem likely that some of the immunities will get attacked and these items that were just changed will be areas where we'll now have to deal with uh, uh, potential litigation uh, or otherwise as it relates to law enforcement. Uh, and I also showed you that because it does appear, like I didn't even mention that one of the laws is going to mandate mental health screenings for all law enforcement officers. Uh, it does seem like this is going to make it more difficult to recruit and retain law enforcement officers. Uh, so I think there's a lot of challenges for localities that have police departments and constitutional officers, particularly sheriffs, uh, uh, in what they're going to have to do in the coming months to deal with some of these changes. Uh, if you go to the next slide. I think I put that slide in twice by accident. It is that important? It needs to be reiterated. <laughs> uh, but I did say earlier there are 10 counties with the police department. Most of the localities are self-insured. Uh, if the law is if, if immunity is taken away, so those laws in themselves are not that bad if you retain some of or most of your immunities, but if the immunities are taken away, it's likely that you will see, particularly localities with police departments, will either likely see higher reinsurance costs or higher deductibles uh, or retentions for, for those coverages. That seems likely. Uh, I said earlier that 85 counties utilize sheriff's office for first response and all 95 use it for court security and corrections and then uh, directly uh, and then indirectly through regional jails. Uh, and I did mention that all of this is mandated by 2.2-1839, but I did want to show you on the next slide, Jeremy, is these are the costs without any of these changes. These are actual costs. So. In fiscal year 2017, localities were paying just under $12 million for coverage. Uh, in the current fiscal year, so just a few years later, it's up to 14 million. So there has been a 20% increase in cost uh, for localities uh, for their constitutional officer coverage uh, in the past couple of years. So uh, right now, localities are being charged back by the uh, comp board the uh, state compensation board is charging back $14 million to localities for this coverage for their sheriffs. Uh, it is likely that you're going to see these chargebacks and, and understand the uh, uh, governing body. So the board of supervisors have no control over this cost. You don't get to decide what deductible you want to take. You don't get to decide what limits you want. You don't get to decide any of this. These are just chargebacks against your sheriff's uh, reimbursement or your constitutional officer's reimbursements. Uh, these costs are going to go up, uh, and if, if uh, immunity is taken away in a meaningful way, you will see these costs go up considerably, and frankly, there is nothing any locality can do about it. Uh, you will get charged back whatever the state's actuary says they need to charge you back for. Uh, so that's kind of a scary little uh, item that's in there, is uh, all of this stuff is going to get done by the General Assembly, and you have no control over the cost of it or how it's going to be charged back or uh, how it, what it's going to look like. 
so, so the the, uh, the law enforcement uh, uh, any uh, you know maybe a little bit scarier than the workers comp because at least with the workers comp we can project and control. Uh, we can provide risk management services. Uh, we can, you know, provide PPE. We can, you know, th th there's a lot of things that we can do. On this one, there's almost nothing because the, the Board of Supervisors doesn't really control the activities of the sheriff, uh, and, um, and the locality doesn't really have any control over the cost of, of how cost gets allocated back to the sheriff. And uh, I've been around long enough that I remember when the comp board was covering about 90% of the cost of the constitutional officer. Uh, uh, where today, I, geez, I haven't seen it lately, but it can't be much different than 50-50 at this point. Uh, so localities are bearing an ever greater share of constitutional officer costs. Uh, and uh, if these changes go through, that number will just continue to go up. Uh, so this one actually for me is a little bit scary considering that you really exercise the least amount of control over this particular item. Do you have any questions on that, Jeremy? Yeah, Chris, and if you don't have this this info um, in front of you, that that's all right. But I know that we had some concerns with the legislation that really was attacking qualified immunity, and and thankfully that was kind of pushed to the Boyd Graves conference for further study analysis. But to your point, it will likely be coming back. Um, have we seen in any other neighboring states? adopt have they adopted proposals similar to what the ga considered this special session or will likely consider in the full session and if so do we know what the impact has been there uh, so I, I i have looked at some neighboring states um, uh, the answer to that is um, so virginia has a lot of immunity right now that most of our neighboring states don't have currently um, so in North Carolina, for example, you have immunity, but uh, you waive it to the degree that you purchase insurance. So if you buy a $5 million insurance policy, you waive your immunity to $5 million. Um, you know, uh, that's how a lot of states operate. Some states have tort caps. South Carolina has a $600,000 tort cap. Uh, it all looks a little bit different, but, but um, Costs for law enforcement coverage in Virginia because of the immunity have always been somewhat of an afterthought uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, for counties, most counties don't have law enforcement. They have constitutional officers. Uh, but you can see on that chart that's still on the screen that um, costs are escalating in this space right now even without these changes and have been escalating even without these changes. Uh, this will just escalate uh, the speed at which these costs escalate. Uh, mm -hmm. Virginia has, Virginia historically has had low cost for these particular items. Uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, the discussion really is that uh, localities, if these changes are made, are going to have to make room in their budget to pay some of these costs that they haven't historically had to pay. Uh, just to give you an example, it's not uncommon in West Virginia for the cost of insurance to make up as much as 10 to 15 percent of the entire budget for the locality. Wow. Um, so if you were to take, say, a, a locality with a $100 million budget, it wouldn't necessarily be out of the realm of possibility for that locality to be paying, uh, you know, um, a substantial amount of money for their insurance, uh, uh, where in Virginia that hasn't historically been the case. So. Um, so with some of these changes, you will start seeing uh, a move towards that. Uh, but on the law enforcement side, it will be a move in an area where you don't control. So Virginia is the only state in the country where the locality uh, doesn't manage the risk management exposure for their constitutional officers. Uh, the state does it. Uh, and so that is... Uh, um, that is something that no other states have to deal with. They all manage these costs internally, uh, not through a, a different agency or, or even a, a different type of organization like a state versus a locality. It's, it's an unusual set of circumstances. Certainly. Thank you, Chris. That, that was very informative. Uh, so then we'll move into the uh, next section, which is the cyber liability issues. Uh, I'll just spend a few minutes going through the types of cyber events, go through a few considerations on the cyber side, and then go through uh, some guidance that recently came out from the U.S. Treasury on uh, cyber events, particularly as it relates to ransom payments. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. 
Uh, we just sent this information out to our county members, so most of our contacts in our county governments, or all of our members received it, but on the county side, um, you know, since COVID started, since the pandemic started, we've seen, or the federal government has seen uh, through its FBI cybercrime unit, about a 300% increase uh, in complaints. Uh, so, so the FBI used to receive around 1,000 complaints per day. Uh, over the past seven months, it's gone up to three to 4,000 cyber complaints per day uh, on average. And, and you know what's unusual about this is the cyber organizations are actually pretty well organized, uh, and they have not targeted hospitals. So they have all agreed to not target getting any data from hospitals. So. Uh, so, with hospitals being off of the hook, some of this has gotten redirected towards local government. If we can go to the next slide. The main types of events we deal with are cyber extortion or ransom events. Those can usually take uh, place in a couple of different ways. One of them is they can lock up a server and you would have to pay a ransom to get access to the key. Uh, to uh, decrypt the server and get access to your data back, which is why it's critically important that you have good backups that are stored off-site. Um, but uh, but at the other uh, type of cyber extortion event is where uh, a uh, um, bad actor gets access to uh, data that's considered um, that has personal identifiers in it, so uh, name and social security number that, that can be connected, uh, or personal health information. Um, so that's what we're seeing on the cyber extortion side uh, where uh, uh, entities are being asked to pay a ransom. Uh, then you have just a straight data breach, uh, which is uh, again where PII, PII or PHI, so uh, uh, personal identifiers or personal health information is taken. And then we have what uh, is referred to in the insurance world as social engineering events. And those are your typical fraud events, and we've, we've seen quite a few of these where um, a uh, bad actor poses as a vendor for a locality, uh, requests that the uh, payment uh, uh, terms be uh, changed, so they change the bank, and they send information to change bank accounts, mm -hmm. and uh, the locality start forwarding payments to fraudulent bank accounts. Uh, the legitimate vendor quits getting paid. The illegitimate uh, vendor starts getting paid, and then you have a fraud event. Uh, we have uh, we have seen basically these as our main sources of cyber activity for local governments. You know, unlike unlike um, you know uh, uh, Target or uh, Capital One, um, you don't have the same type of business interruption exposures. People still have to pay their taxes, so. Uh, uh, business interruption as it would relate to a private entity, we don't see much of in the government world. If we go to the next slide, uh, we sent this out as well, uh, but um, uh, really you need to notify us immediately um, if you have a cyber event or a suspected cyber event. If you're not sure, but you think you may have had a cyber event, we will uh, put you in touch with uh, our cyber attorney uh, our cyber attorney will help you make those determinations. Uh, uh, and, and in concert with that, we ask you not to make any statements to the press uh, until after you have spoken to the cyber attorney. And the cyber attorney will help you craft any statements that you do make. Uh, uh, so uh, we will appoint your uh, legal counsel. And then the legal counsel, so that you have uh, uh, attorney-client privilege, uh, the legal counsel will enter into the work orders with the forensic firms and the public relations firms, crisis management firms, if we need to involve uh, credit monitoring agencies or notification agencies or uh, whatever it may be, uh, uh, we will uh, get those uh, people involved through the attorney uh, so that we have all of the information protected from a uh, confidentiality perspective. Uh, so there's a specific way to deal with cyber events, and I will tell you, um, it is difficult for us to handle these, and we are handling more of these than anybody in the state on the local government side. Uh, so these are difficult for us to handle, and we're handling most of them. Uh, this will take all local governments out of their comfort zone if they have this happen. Uh, so we ask you to rely on us to assist on these cyber liability issues because 
this is going to be an event that happens to you much less frequently than we're going to see it with the number of local, you know, we cover almost 600 localities uh, between counties, cities, towns, schools, authorities, community service boards, so on and so forth. Uh, we're dealing with these a lot more than you are, and um, um, there's a specific way to deal with these that's much different than anything else you deal with from an insurance and claim side, and hopefully you'll only see one of these once in your career. If hopefully never, but but it's not like you're going to see one of these every day. Uh, so we ask you to go through that, go through that process with us. Uh, but uh, we are seeing those. And Jeremy, to give you an idea, our cyber liability claims counts have doubled every year for the past seven years. Wow. Uh, so this is so, a this is a trend that's not going anywhere uh, anywhere in a positive direction. At least it's just going to get worse. You're, th you're saying. Correct. Uh, you know, when uh, when we started offering cyber insurance, we threw it on as an endorsement to our GL policy and didn't charge anybody for it. Uh, and uh, now we're handling, um, you know, we're going to hand, we'll handle, you know, probably about somewhere between 25, probably around 25, give or take a few uh, uh, events this year. Uh, last year we handled uh, 12 or 13. Uh, this year we'll we'll probably handle close to 25, and next year I expect we'll we'll probably keep moving in the uh, in that direction. Now, what hit us by surprise, and frankly, we're in the middle of ongoing handling of several cyber events right now. Uh, the cyber events we're handling right now deal with uh, ransom type of events. Uh, so, uh, um, if you'll go to the next one, uh, so. The types of events where we deal with uh, ransom are, uh, like I said earlier, when one, servers are encrypted, or two, uh, to prevent sensitive data with PII and or PHI from being posted on the dark web. Uh, so um, there have been instances where ransoms have been paid. Most of the ransoms have been paid to get the key to decrypt a server. Uh, we've started to see uh, mostly private entities uh, paying ransom for uh, uh, keeping uh, customer or, or other information off of the dark web. Um, but on October 1st, so, so just now less than three weeks ago, uh, the U.S. Treasury issued guidance on ransom payments. Uh, they're utilizing the national security, uh, you're utilizing national security and foreign asset control as the basis for this guidance. Uh, but they are now threatening sanctions against any organization or financial institution, meaning insurers that make ransom payments. Um, so although your coverage through Vaycorp or any other cyber insurer is likely to have coverage for uh, data extortion, including ransom payments. Um, the ability to make those payments is now in question. Uh, so that's a uh, open item that we have right now and one that we're actively working on. But um, um, but this guidance is brand new. Um, we were actually actively discussing uh, uh, ransom payments uh, uh, on uh, existing claims that we had, and uh, and this when this came out, so uh, so we have not made any ransom payments on any claims in Virginia that I'm aware of by a local government. Um, I believe the uh, mayor's association has taken a position against making ransom payments at all. It appears as though the federal government is now taking a position with respect to ransom payments, uh, and this is a, this is an item that we'll have to keep monitoring as well. But uh, but as of right now, we would be hesitant to consider making a ransom payment based off of this information. Mm. I think I just made a recommendation to all local governments to make sure you're backing up your data. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's one of those interesting developing items that's out there. Uh, this is something that, uh, as opposed to the other items that we've discussed where we've been handling these matters for almost 30 years, this, this is new. Uh, most of our real activity on the cyber side is, is less than three years old. Uh, um, um, so, so the data is all new, the projections are all new, and the uh, guidance and the laws on it are all new as well. So that's really all I have for this presentation, Jeremy. I'm happy to answer any more questions. Well, thank you, Chris. As always, uh, anytime that you present in front of ACO, I always leave our presentations feeling 
uh, a lot of concern, but also a lot of hope that we know that you're out there as a resource and a partner in dealing with these issues. Uh, so can't thank you enough for the work that you and your team do every day uh, to help local governments and to help us as well. And I guess uh, the one last question, and I'll leave it open ended for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to expand upon about how VACOR can serve as a resource for county governments? Any any parting thoughts before we we wrap up? Well, I mean, I think you actually used the word that uh, that I would I would recommend all of our uh, uh, local governments uh, in the state is we are here as a resource. Um, we uh, spend a lot of time making sure that we're up to speed on all of these items. Uh, there's no need uh, for any locality to try to go it alone uh, when they have something happen. Um, we're pretty good at being uh, flexible and responsive uh, when a, uh, a issue comes up for a local government. So we would just encourage uh, all of the localities to use uh, our staff uh, uh, as a resource, and um, uh, and we'll we'll uh, uh, get the right people involved um, to uh, provide that that support and assistance. Well, well said and well, thank you again, Chris. I think that does wrap up our time for today. Uh, just thank you and the team for putting the, together this presentation, sharing it with our members and uh, our conference goers and uh, as well as the work you do in partnership with VACO. Uh, really appreciate uh, all your work and assistance on this. Thank you.